the old stuff that was good. The old stuff that was very good, and there was something about it that is well studied nowadays. But there are old things but goodies. I think that really is the, the definition. And there's not exactly a coherent methodology that defines that. So classical music, there's if you you know, I'm not that well versed in music theory, but I can even detect that there's differences in Baroque music versus you know some other type of classical music that I don't even know the names of. But I kind of know that there's some feelings there, um, and you can hear them pretty easily. But classical stuff, it's there's not necessarily rules. A lot of times you do see that classicism and frequentism are conflated. And so, and a lot of people use the language that way. And so I always just ask, what do you mean? You know, what kind of, you know, and so especially when we're interviewing people, I want to see that people kind of have a, well, here's about how I think about problems. I have some ideas on who I am. And I don't mind the, the answer that I'm flexible in certain settings, though. And so I've spent a lot of time deciding, you know, when I'll do what. It's through practice. But classicism isn't well defined. And Fisher is not necessarily just a frequentist. This argument between Nathan Pearson and Fisher, where Fisher is using a p-value as a direct measure of evidence against the null, a small measure. I'll always say compared to what. We'll come back around to that. But when you say small compared to what and what that means, is the important question. So small is not well defined. And so Neyman and Pearson said, well, if you duck alpha with your p-value, then you'll be rejecting at a frequentist rate inappropriately. The type 1 error will be alpha. So we gave a frequentist interpretation to that. They did. So p-value on its own is not a frequentist tool. Something else. Fisher is just kind of wrong, though, in his utility of it. Um, we'll get into that to some degree. And Naaman and Pearson gave up a coherent frequentist interpretation by introducing a sharp threshold. So he's calibrating air rates, air rates, frequentism. It's a rate, you know, of doing this over and over and over again. What would the air rates be? So on average, how often are you wrong in different directions? So frequentism has some notion of frequency attached to it. So confidence interval is a frequentist tool because it has this inherent frequentist interpretation that they cover the true parameter at some rate. So if you say I've got a 95% confidence interval, we'll be talking about this through the class, but if you've never heard of this, you should go take some introductory stats class so you at least know what these tools are. But intervals to use for some sort of uncertainty analysis, but the frequentist says the only property there really is, is does it cover the true parameter? And so, um, I usually like to ask what kind of frequentist are you? Because if you've ever done this, even in a stat 101 class, let's say you have non-normal data, but you use X bar and you know the central limit theorem kicks in. And so you say I want a 95% confidence interval, so you take X bar and you plus minus two standard errors. 1.96, if we'd like to quibble over what that number is. 1.96 times the standard error plus minus X bar. If you know your normal theory, under the central limit theorem, that's about 95% coverage on something. And they had to do a pivot to get there, and we'll talk about that in this class. What the interpretation of that thing is, what is really random. And so, you've got to get all this right, but that's supposed to cover at 95%, but if your data is not normal and the central limit theorem hasn't quite kicked in, you might be saying you're a 95% frequentist, but you're really only covering 87% of the time. You know what I think of that? You're not a frequentist. It's just something you said. So you didn't check. So anybody that thinks that they're a frequentist needs to check and verify what their actual rates are, not just what theory tells you in a limit. So the asymptotic frequentist, that's kind of nice. I like to take my ideas to the limit and see what happens, but I really want to know what actually happens on the thing that I'm reporting. And so an asymptotic frequentist is a mathematician. So there are some people that try to become exact frequentists or more precise frequentists. Here's kind of a trick. A Bayesian can be an extremely good frequentist. We'll see examples of that. So you will hear things like, the Bayesian is not that they're different. What if I pick a prior and I come up with a prior such that my credible intervals, my intervals that measure area under the posterior, 
So 95% Bayesian interval, the credible interval, the belief interval, where you think theta is. Um, I can just chop up area under the posterior distribution that I form under Bayes' theorem, and that is at least one such credible interval. There's an infinite number of ways you can make those. So some of them are better. Short ones are probably pretty good. They're less, certain. They're less uncertain about things. If it so happens that I've chosen my prior in such a way that my interval happens to cover the true parameter 95% of the time, and I'm saying it's 95% interval, I've got a good frequentist problem. So it turns out in things like the binomial example, so for measuring P, the Bayesian is almost always the optimal frequentist, whooping up on the person that says that they're the frequentist. We'll see a few examples like this. So there's overlap between these things, but it really is a what are you thinking about? And I think the sub-definitions are almost more important than the broad over definitions. So I want you to think that if you don't understand all that, then it means you haven't decided who you are yet. So, and if you're good, you'll be open-minded for a long time and leave a little bit of room. There are some frequentist things that I jump at real quick and I go, it's not worth doing the full Bayesian thing. And so why is the question? Why do I think that? We have to see a lot of examples to understand all this. I want to just cap off our conversation from last time about independence versus conditional independence. This was kind of what I was talking about. Um, let's look at an example real quick. After that, we're gonna go through the bootstrap. Fiducialism is dead. If you did read about fiducial statistics or anything like that, um, in a nutshell, it's this. Now, this isn't 100% correct but I don't think it's worth taking the time to try to be correct because the thing is flawed and wrong and problematic anyway. So that doesn't mean you can't study it and do research on it. Just do it after you get your PhD and you're gone. <laughs> so, um, Fisher didn't want to be a Bayesian for a long time. And so he just kind of used the likelihood like it was a distribution over the parameter space. Just write down the likelihood. Bayesian writes likelihood times prior. They're invoking Bayes' theorem so that they can do the conditional flip in the distributions. That's how they're thinking about it. And it looks like Bayes' theorem. Sometimes it's not exactly Bayes' theorem, though. Depends on what, if that prior is, if it's not an actual probability distribution, is that Bayes' theorem? Well, it's Bayes' theorem like. It looks like the same machinery, and there's some other interpretations. And if you want to be real mathematical, we can find all that through limits. Um, But if you just take the likelihood and you use it without even considering what you're multiplying by as a probability distribution, that's just wrong. It's not what it is. And it has some fundamentally problematic things that come up. Now, Fisher first recognized this when he was dealing with the normal distribution. And a lot of people, when they're trying to measure the mean in a normal distribution, will use the flat prior, they'll multiply by one. And so it turns out the Bayesian and the fiducialist do the exact same thing, but the Bayesian doesn't like that you didn't say you were using the basis rule. If you start using that line of thinking um, with any arbitrary likelihood, you can get yourself in trouble real quick. So how you penalize the space is important. So nobody does fiducialism anymore, it's something old. I just wanted to throw that out that people, really smart people, have been coming up with ideas for a long time, and some of them are not right. So, Fisher included, but Fisher also had a lot of huge contributions. Okay, let's just um, talk about independence versus conditional independence. I want you to see my code right here, P is equal to 0 0.7, and what I'm gonna be doing is just flipping a coin. So I'm flipping some number of coins. I can plug this in, flip coins, number of flips is my parameter. Okay, P is 0.7, and it just flips things over and over again. So I'm just invoking the binomial random number generator. I'm plugging in n is equal to 1, so that's a Bernoulli equation. I'm just doing them one at a time, and you get to see these things, what my flips are. Let's run this code. So remember this, P is 0.7. And I'm going to flip some coins. 
So let's flip 10 points. Let me just ask you as you're seeing these 10 coin flips happen and as you get to observe them, do you think that those coin flips are independent of each other? Pretty much. Am I learning anything as I see the data go through? You're not. Why? Ben? You know P. You know P. You can watch that until you're blue in the face and you won't learn anything. So those are IID drops. I know P. I know full description of the probability space. Those feel very independent of each other. And so independence being this sort of thing, can I use the previous data to forecast future data? So that's the notion of independence. Either it factorizes into the margins or the conditionals don't give any information. Okay. So this sort of thing. Is X2 and X1 the probability distribution of this equal to the probability distribution of X2? That's my notion of independence, or these are just two different draws. Or, you can write it like this, probability of X1 and X2 is equal to the probability of X1 times the probability of X2. So the margin is factorized. If I take PX1 over to this other side, it is that conditional distribution. So these are both the exact same definitions. Just a little bit of rearrangement through some algebra. And so, but I like looking at it this way. Does my first draw tell me anything about the second draw? We're taking this a little bit further. Do nine draws tell me about the tenth draw? If I tell you P, then yeah, this is kind of true. So this isn't true with the data in here, but if I put P in here, if I condition on P everywhere, so condition on P here, condition on P here, condition on P, then this statement is true. And everything factorizes, and I can't use the old data to forecast the future. But if I don't condition on P, I don't think it's true anymore. Let's test this theory. So here's something I'm gonna do. Black out the projector. And you can probably guess what I'm doing. What do you think I did? So I'm not going to let you know anymore. So what I did at the beginning of the last test class is I just started rolling the dice and hoping you thought you knew P, but of course I got scooped with it about three years. So, but hold on, you got to tell me P. So, what are the probabilities of the faces of my die? So let's undo that. And I'll ask the same question, are these data independent? You don't know my model anymore. So, seeing a whole bunch of tails is certainly telling me something. What am I really doing? I'm estimating Q. So the factorization exists either way. I can write this down. But if I wanted to know what the distribution of those 10 data points are, I can use Given P, I can use that they were being drawn independently given knowledge of P. And so I can write this down. Fxi given P. So this factorization exists given you know P. So we use the notion of independence to build the model that this is true. And now I'm going to use this to infer what P is. But certainly the data is able to help you forecast future data even though it was generated independently. What are you really doing? You're learning the parameters through one. So one of them I call independence. I would say that in math class if we were dealing with sets. But in stats inference class when we're dealing with data, we're really talking about conditional independence. Okay? So that's the word we slot in. When we say IID, we're implying it. So, because we're saying identically distributed with no knowledge of theta, and I know the distribution. So just make sure that you understand those two things. In Vegas, looking at the board on the roulette thing doesn't help you because you know what the probabilities are, presumably, on the roulette wheel. So, you guys know this game? Everybody knows this game, right? 
spin a wheel, drop a ball, it lands on some colored thing with a number, and if you guess correctly where it's gonna land, you win money. And then they show you at the roulette table what the last 20 spins were. And people look at it and go, wow, there are four blacks in a row, I'm gonna bet on red this time. And it's like, if you didn't know what the colors were, if you didn't get to observe it, that would be information. You should just watch it all day until you figure out what the colors are and then decide whether or not you want to play. So it's all about really what the probabilities are. So anybody that's ever played the game knows when there's two green things on the roulette table, don't play that one. So you're just gonna lose quickly. Roulette is designed to make you lose, but the double greens are big losses. Don't play that one. Play the other one and lose slower so you can hang out longer. It's the biggest one. Okay, so the difference between independence and conditional independence is if I show you P, if you know P, all that stuff. Okay, so that's the language I'm going to use throughout class. Let's move to this other thing called the bootstrap. So this is a neat tool. And this tool, I think, will conceptually teach you what a statistician is trying to do. So what they would like to do. It uses kind of the notion of what I would like to do and what I can actually do. So let me just start with a uh, simple question. And it's not well phrased. So I see data. And I want to compute some statistic of that data. I want to know what it is. And so how do I actually learn what this thing is? Well, the obvious solution is take your data, plug it into whatever that function t is that I'm not being specific of, about, but it's just some function, I plug it in, it gives me a number back. And so you just compute it. So, just compute it. Now, of course, there's gonna be the question, what is t and why did I pick it? So maybe this function of x helps me to estimate theta or some function of theta that I'm interested in. So usually our statistics are not just arbitrary. So we'll look at a couple that we're usually interested in, things like means and variances. But the problem with this answer is that if I went back out into the universe and I sampled n more data points and I recomputed this function, it would change. Different sample because the sample is random. And the statistic is then random. So it'll change. So I can give you a number but we know that that number will change every time we do this. So what we really want to know is what this thing is estimating and how close is it to it on average, or what is the description of its probability distribution? How much does it flood? So statisticians exist simply because of this question. You go out, you collect data, you use it to estimate something. You might think you have a pretty good estimator of something, but you go out, you do the exact same process, you compute again, and you get a wildly different answer. And so the statistician is trying to tell you how certain you are about the things that T of X is estimating. So let me just write this down. Just compute it, but you're uncertain about what it estimates. So I don't mean you're uncertain about theoretically what it estimates, you're uncertain about the actual thing you've computed, how close it is to the truth. So let me just say, i.e., how close is Tx to its truth? just ask you conceptually, if I wanted to know precisely what TX was estimating, what could you do? Say you had free reign over the entire universe. If I wanted to drag all the uncertainty out of this problem. Get all the data? Yeah, go get all the data. So basically crank N to infinity. So if you could do anything, go get more data. And all of a sudden, if this thing is estimating something, 
then all of a sudden it won't have any variation to it if I plug it in under the entire you know distribution of data and so I wouldn't be uncertain about it at all so let's give you a concrete example more concrete problem is with if I gave that as my answer go get me more data then they're not coming back so I'm supposed to do something once I walk in the door not say well go out and collect data for infinity and then come back and I'll compute this function for you and I'll what I think the answer is so that's what we're trying to avoid doing so let's say I have some data I ID again I'm not going to write it down end out points and we want to know distribution of this of tx. Now, tx is computed under a finite sample size of n. And I want to know what that distribution is. So that's the question a statistician is always trying to answer. What distribution does this test statistic follow? Of course, building statistics that have less variability in them in the first place, that's a major punchline in our class. Is how do we come up with the stuff that hones in on the truth fastest as a function of n? We're not quite there yet. We're going to presuppose we've got a statistic we want. We want to know the distribution of this thing. So here's one solution. Here's my solution that gets me fired. But I have 10 years, so no big deal. So you can't actually do it. So this is now what I tell everybody to do. So people come in. And they say, I want to know the distribution of t of x. This is a function, I'll remind you, of n. Usually, if n is bigger, there's less, there's less variability in the distribution of the statistic. So that's going to be controlling the variability of the statistic. So here's what I tell somebody to do. I say, OK, so I first step one, compute t of x. Now I only have one data point right here. So I've got my t of x function here. And I'm going to plot what I've got. So this is the number that I compute. And then I tell my scientist or engineer, go collect me a whole bunch more of those. Do exactly what you did over and over and over again. So go back and collect TX. I'm going to write down one. I'll tell you what these are in a second. T of X two. T of X. I'll call it cap B. So this right here, all of these. Samples from F. And I'll say there are N IID samples from F. So each one of these is a replicated N data point sample set. So I went to F. We can maybe imagine F looks weird. You can say it looks like that. This is f, x given theta. This is x. I go into the sampling distribution, and I grab n data points from it. So what that means is that I reach in without regard to my last data point that I've grabbed, and I grab a data point with relative frequency proportional to the height of the curve. And so over here, right here, I'd be grabbing values more often here than I would over here lower. That's what it means to sample II. So that distribution stays the same and I just grab n data points and I compute 
a test it just did. Then I forget that I did it, I do it again, grab end data points, I plug it into T to compute it, and then I do this some number of times. And I'll tell the scientist, my job as the statistician is to tell the scientist how many times I want him to do that. I wouldn't have a job if, I, if this was the thing, but this is what we fantasize about. This is what we'd like to do. So now I have a whole bunch of these data points right here. Now this is F, and what I'm doing is I'm taking a function of the data points from that and I'm computing them. Now it depends on what T is, but let's end up saying I ended up computing something and it looked like this. And I could make some histogram that looked like that. So this is completely arbitrary, I'm just kind of making it up. Depends on what T was. And so, depending on what B is, right here, if it's real big, this histogram will get real smooth. And it'll start to converge to the distribution of the T's. So it'll answer this question. That's exactly what we're doing. We're just mechanically doing everything without math. And so I get a whole bunch of samples of T by collecting N data points over and over and over again. So how many data points have I collected? N times cap B. So to form this whole thing. And you would come back and say, this is a horrible idea, Scotland, although you've answered the question precisely. So I've answered the question that I have the distribution of T at least very, very closely. And if you say I'm not close enough, since I have free reign over the universe and the scientists and engineers and how much they want to work and collect samples, they're willing to go out and do this over and over again. So I can get close as you want me to. So this is my fiction. This doesn't happen. So why is this a horrible answer? I haven't used the data very well in doing this. And so I have information about this function under just n data points. But I really have n b data points. And so I could form a more precise estimator just by plugging in all n b data points into one t function. And so that's a bad utility of data. But since I'm just wasting everybody's time and energy, I don't really care. And so Conceptually, this is what I would like to do. And if somebody gave me this power to do this, I'd have really good answers for people all the time and never be able to write a paper on how I did it. But this would be a magic trick. So we don't actually do this. It's a bad answer. It's a bad answer. Because it's inefficient. Now I can do it on a computer if I wanted to. And I could start answering questions about what are the properties of my procedure of wasting a lot of time. If I knew F, my life gets easier because I could start doing some math to answer the questions. But right now, I'm not going to let you know what F is, but of course, you could surmise a guess. So I'm going to consider a different procedure, and I'm going to compare the two procedures to each other. So I'm going to tell you about the bootstrap before I show you my code. Bootstrap is very much like what I've just described. So just keep in mind, the X's, these replicated data sets in this solution right here, came from the sampling distribution. So I went back to the universe and recollected samples every single time. So I had to do a lot of work to do that. The bootstrap is almost just like this, but instead of going back to the universe and collecting data, you go back to your original data set and you sample with replacement n times. So let me just write it down and I'll talk about what that means. So bootstrap. So again, our goal is to learn 
the distribution. of Tx. We brute forced it over here. We just went back and built a histogram approximation to the distribution of Tx. And the more time we are willing to waste, the better our approximation is. So here's what we do. I'm going to do this cat B time. So I'm going to repeat a process. I've repeated a process over here cat B time, so we'll stick with the same notation. What I'm going to do is I'm going to start with my original data set. This is the only data set you're going to see. X1, Xn. You get to observe. is I'm going to compute this thing under a replicated data set, but instead of going compute TB, but T of XB where XB, I'll just write down, this is a sample, if I mess something up, sample with replacement from X, our original data set, n times. So I do get some replicated data set. So we might call this a bootstrap replicate. That's the language that we usually use. So all I've done right here is I've collected a new <coughs> data set. Instead of going out to the population and resampling, I go to my sample and I resample. From that, 10 times. Let me just ask you real quickly, why did I do this? with replacement and not without replacement. That replacement just gives you the original data set? That's right. So without replacement, you just get the original data set every single time, and there would be no variation in that data set. And then we just store, I'll say, TXB. Let me ask another question. Why did we sample with replacement n times? The statistic depends on what n is. And so we're saying something about our knowledge with n data points. If we ended up doing this more than n times, we'd be fooling ourselves about how much information is in that original data set. And so we want these statistics to have the same properties. Let me just ask a question real quick. Are these IIP samples in the original algorithm? By definition. So IIID sample the X's from the original distribution. And then I computed them so they're IID replicates. What about these? Are these IID? Not quite. If N in the original data set was exceedingly large, then they would be very, very close to IID. So it depends on what n is. So imagine I had a data set with just one data point in it. It's an IID sample from the original thing. If I just sample with replacement every single time, how much correlation are there in my samples? Complete. So they're exactly the same replicates. If I had only two data points in the original sample, they would be, there would be some dependence in which one I'm grabbing, I would see a lot of repeated values. And so if n were pretty big, then I might feel like I'm by ID sampling. So here's the difference right here. So in the original scheme, I'm going back to the original F and I'm sampling. 
in the bootstrap, let's just say these are your sample. If I just go back and I sample from the original sample, I'm almost sampling from the original distribution. And if there are a lot of points in here, it would look and feel like I were sampling from the original distribution. So the bootstrap is just a process that estimates this thing we want to do. Now, if the number of samples, if I didn't have any samples over here, then my samples aren't a very good description of this universe I'm trying to sample from. And these methods will be a mismatch from each other. The answers that I would get from doing this and from Bootstrapper would be very different because my samples wouldn't have information about the true f over here. And so what does n need to be in the original sample for this to be a good technique is probably the most common question I get about this. It depends on how wiggly the original sample is. So if the original sampling distribution has a lot of complexity, I'm going to need a lot of data to estimate the variation. And so the bootstrap really just says that if your sample is able to estimate all the properties of your distribution, your underlying distribution, then resampling from it will give you a good approximation to the variation um, of the statistics that you want to compute. So let me just say it again, that if your sample has good information about the underlying distribution, then the bootstrap can use that sample and resample from it to estimate that variation in F. And it kind of just makes sense. And so two types of asymptotics, one is based off of N, and that underlies how good of a sample you have. Now I will point out that if you don't have a good sample that estimate that doesn't tell me about certain wiggly features of the distribution that I need to know about, there's nothing you can do to fix that. You need more data. So unless you just happen to know from the hand of the statistical gods what that distribution was. And so the things that the bootstrap kind of presupposes are the things that every technique presupposes, that I've got enough information about the wiggly patterns in my underlying distribution. So I'm able to control that uncertainty. Okay, and so what we're gonna do is we're just gonna plot a histogram of all of these. So at the end of the day, we take these things and we plot some histogram. And maybe it looks like this. We've got it. So let me just ask a question about the other type of asymptotics. Those are controlled by B. How big should B be? Uh, I had a question. Um, if your data is limited to a finite amount, like a finite discrete number of outcomes, would you still call that IID in the limit? What do you mean? Like if you have X can take on only three values. And it can only take on three values and I have a sample from it. Yes. No problem. That's all right. Well, that that makes the problem easier. So then I only need to see like a couple things because that sample space isn't very variable. So it'll work even better in that case. So I'll call this right here the bootstrap distribution. This is my bootstrap distribution. It's supposed to replicate this thing at least closely. How big should B be? I love B. I don't love N because N I have no control over. So this is the thing that the asymptotic frequentists are always taking to the limit. N to do their sort of how do these procedures work. Devise procedures under those sort of assumptions. It's a funny assumption because if you could take N to the limit, you know the answer. So you should know the answer. So how big should we be? Nowadays the answer is just crank it up, make it real big. So when this distribution stops moving, so B were real small, every time I did this, this bootstrap distribution would wiggle around. And so you want to basically crank up B until this thing stops moving. So you might monitor some statistics. Like what's the mean? What's the variation? Did those things stop moving? Um, one more question. How many 
unique bootstrap rabbit kits are there. What I mean is I've got x1 through xn data points. Put a label on each one. So I'm not talking about if two of the values are the same. Let's call those all unique values. If I see multiplicity in there, it's telling me that the distribution is high at that point. And so based off of the x1 through xn label points, the n data points, how many different sampling with replacements can I get that are all different from each other? What is it? So Ben says n to the n. That sounds pretty good because it would mean n needs to be really small to get a whole bunch of variability in my bootstrap distribution. Turns out that's not the answer. Give you the answer real quick. It's gonna be 2n minus 1 choose n minus 1. I'll let you work on why that's true. Okay. That is not right now. So, but this is the answer. This is a stars and bars partitioning argument. How many partitions can I make in the data? So if you're familiar with combinatorics and doing those analyses, this is the answer. This number's still really big, is what I want to point out. So if n is small, that number's big, so there's a lot of different bootstrap replicates. Cranking this number up way past that would be a waste of time. So why don't we just fill out all the unique bootstrap replicates? Why are we sampling? Instead of just computing every unique bootstrap replicate. Does anybody know the answer? So I'm just throwing darts and coming up with these bootstrap replicates. But presumably, I'm using all these different rearrangements, resamplings of the data to come up with the distribution. There's only so many I can come up with. So you want a frequency. If you do that, if you just compute every possible one, you'd get a uniform distribution over all of them. Yeah, but then I would know how many would come up. They're all equally likely to come up. So I have a uniform distribution over those partitions. But those, obviously, don't have the same distribution in T. And so if I ran this thing, let's make this huge. So as big as you can think about and multiply that by a bazillion. So make this thing really big. If you ended up plotting all the unique bootstrap replicates over here and you ran this thing a bazillion times, you'd get the same answers. So the reason we throw darts and don't compute every one is, this is computationally way more intensive. Typically, B can be very small compared to that number in practice. You'll notice that the bootstrap distribution stabilizes well before I do this many iterations. So it's just for making the algorithm super simple. Throwing darts is a simple thing to do, and it's hard to do. Most people didn't believe that a long time ago. Statistician said it was true, and now we have statistics departments based off of this principle. Okay, so I've written a piece of code that implements this whole thing. When was this algorithm sort of developed? Yeah, so a couple different incarnations of this. So in the early 1900s, they came up with something called the jackknife. And so anytime you hear people talk about the jackknife, it's either because they're using a very old textbook. And so instead of going and doing all of this sort of stuff, um, they would do a simpler algorithm where they would remove one data point from the data set. So you had an n minus one data set, not quite n, but you would look over the n different ways you could form those. And you could write them all down and you approximately have the same asymptotics as the original problem, so long n was moderate. So that's the first version of it, pretty silly. I don't like to even talk about it, because don't do it. Don't jackknife bootstrap. And so bootstrapping is just the, the next level of that. So 70s is when everybody started getting computers on their desk. So Brad Efron saw this, saw this basic question, what if I don't know F, 
I don't want to model it. I don't want to work out any math. What can I do? So there's this old adage of picking yourself up by your bootstraps. Has anybody ever heard this term? So it wasn't a very cleverly named algorithm. It's like sometimes when you can't, you know, nothing can help you, you gotta just help yourself. And that's where he came up with it. So it can't do anything else, so I'll just do this. This is a good idea. It's the frequentist savior. I want to point out that we're IID sampling from the original sample. So if the original sample wasn't IID, this does not work. So there is this idea of IID miss. Now there are block variants of this where you can block your data and do things to try to get this sort of scheme to work in non-IID cases, but we're not going to talk about that. So the basic vanilla bootstrap absolutely requires IID. So 70s, I think Brad Efron started writing some papers on this. He wrote a big book, but really the book is the first four pages, and it's the central limit there. You know, and so, but you can write a book on it. If any of you want to see it, I have it on my bookshelf. So, but pretty much you know almost everything about Bootstrap so far. We'll spend another half lecture talking about it probably. So here's my code. I'll be putting this, so I have a note to myself, Snap 5114 codes this up themselves. Okay, you're gonna code this up. <laughs> so, and I'm not going to give you this one, but it's super basic and simple. So I have some F that I've defined. What I've been drawing on the board is this three hump distribution. It's three normal distributions superimposed on top of each other, and I'm sampling from that. It's called a mixture model. We'll go over that next time when we come into class. I'm going to sample from it some number of times, and then I'm going to replicate from the population some number of times. So let's say I had n is equal to 31 samples. So that means I can use the central limit there or something like that. So, okay, I didn't know this. Being facetious. I go back to my universe, and I'm going to recollect r replicates from the universe. And then I'm going to do some number of bootstrap replicates. We're going to play around with these numbers next time. My different distributions are going to be guided by some parameters. I'll walk you through these next time, but these all control F. I'll walk you through this code, but basically I'm sampling from one of three normals and I'm flipping a coin to do that. I will show you the original distribution. I'm gonna paste some of this code. Make n big for a second. There's the distribution that underlies the population. There's 10,000 draws from it. So that's my app that I'm saying I don't know and I don't get to know it. And I've got a ton of samples from it so you can discern what f looks like. So f is a little bit funny. So we'll start out with a distribution we don't know the answers to. I'm going to sample from this n times. Let's change n. Let's say my original sample is pretty small, 31. Right here, I'll replicate from it 1,000 times. I'll do 500 bootstrap replicates from only one of those samples. It's going to be my very last sample that I use. I'll kick that into my bootstrap algorithm, and I'll bootstrap resample from it. So I'm not going to use my 1,000 replicates from the data. I'm just going to use one of the replicates. And we'll pick up next time with this code. So this is me going back out into the population, these thousand repeated draws. I'm computing for each one of these a T. My T in this case is the sample mean. We'll change that next time. So I have in here plugged in my mean as my replicated stat. And the bootstrap algorithm is doing the same thing. And the bootstrap is two lines of code like I wrote down. I'll just show you the punchline real quick and we'll pick up with this next time. Okay, here's my replicated stat distribution and here's my bootstrap distribution. 
And so this ended up requiring 1,000 replicates of 31 data points to construct this. And this took 500 bootstrap re replicates from the original data set. How close are these to each other is the question we need to answer. So is this well approximating what I think it's approximating? So super simple procedure. We're going to kick off with this. We'll study this example. It'll probably take us about a half hour next time. And then we're going to start doing some math. That's it for now, you guys.